Now listen, if you promise to tell a friend about it and you call in the next 30 minutes, you'll also receive absolutely free Ron's new sausage making attachment with spices and casings included. If you would, could you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We're going to begin today in John chapter 14, if you're capable of doing so, if you would like to. I want to thank you for honoring the Word of the Lord. I want to thank you for spending part of your day here at Life Church. We don't take that for granted. You could have been on the best lake and the best mall and the best bed at your house, but you came this morning to Life Church, and we thank you for that. We are so indeed grateful and honored and humbled to be able to serve you. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate or comforter, some translations read, who will never leave you. He, that is the advocate or the comforter, is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth, Jesus said. The world cannot receive him, speaking of the Holy Spirit, because it, that is the world, isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him. Turn to your neighbor and say, you know him. Go ahead and tell him, say, you know him. Watch this. Because he lives with you now and watch this terminology that Jesus uses. The Holy Spirit lives with you now, and he later, everybody shout later, will be in you. Let me pause. Those are very clear references, we believe, to the present ministry of the Holy Spirit prior to Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit was poured out as the disciples and others were gathered together in prayer. The Holy Spirit was with them prior to that, but in that moment, in that upper room experience, in what we now refer to as the baptism in the Holy Spirit, Jesus was referring to after that, that the Holy Spirit would be in you. And then he says, no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Father, thank you for your word and the truth that it contains and the moments that we have remaining together. I pray that you would give me the ability to speak with clarity in all of us, Lord, the opportunity to hear clearly what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in these moments. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, but wait, there's more. Just tell him, but wait, there's, there's more. There's always more. Always more. So this is part number two in the message series, but wait, there's more. If you missed last week, you can go to our website, lifechurchsmyrna.com, and click on the resource tab and make yourself available to the recordings, audio, video recordings, everything that's there, the handouts. We encourage you to do so. By the way, if you've not done so already, you ought to check in on your social media, let folks know you're in the house of the Lord, unless you think they would be completely surprised then you might want to fly under the radar screen for a while. But, but anyway, if you can, let them know you're here and, and uh, tune in to what God is saying in some ways. So last week, I talked to you about three things. I said the Holy Spirit brings freedom, the Holy Spirit brings peace, and the Holy Spirit brings fellowship. So if you missed that message, those were the main points. Go back in and, and catch up because there will be a test on all of this material at some point, and God wants you to be ready for that. So today I want to continue this thought on, but wait, there's more. And here's the reason I've titled the series as I have. You, you saw in the, in the short video clip that we have a pretty good understanding, a lot of us, of who God is because we, we have some idea of what a father should be like and how a father should function. Now, admittedly, some of us didn't have the best earthly father as an example, and I, I wish that weren't the case for anybody. I wish everybody had a dad much like my father, who was a wonderful example, not a perfect man, but a wonderful example, a, a guy who modeled faithfulness to his wife and to his family and to his God 
and who helped instill within me and my older and younger brother values that would far outlast his life, which ended in September of 2015 as he made his journey to heaven. But I, I'm thankful for my dad, and I'm, I'm grateful for his influence in my life. So I, it helps me to understand a little bit about who God the Father is. And then I, we have, I think, a pretty good understanding of who Jesus is because he's referred to as like, uh, well, he is God's son, and we have an understanding of what a son how a son functions and what a son does. And we kind of get that because we understand earthly relationships as we do. But then there's the Holy Spirit, and that's not always, he's not quite as easily understood perhaps. And so that's the idea of the series, but wait, there's more. When you place your faith in God through Jesus Christ, we want you to understand and have a better understanding of the present-day ministry of the Holy Spirit. Not just that the Spirit was something was active in the days of the Bible, and working in people's lives and giving them amazing gifts and talents, but that that same Holy Spirit is working in our lives today, giving us amazing gifts and talents and abilities. I'd like the church to say amen right there. That'd be a good spot right there. The, the, the Holy Spirit didn't just cease to exist, uh, you know, on the last page of the New Testament or something like that, but the Holy Spirit's still working in our lives today. Now, but because we don't always understand uh, about the Holy Spirit, perhaps. Maybe you were brought up in a church, or maybe you weren't brought up in church at all, and so all of this is kind of new. I've shared with you a little bit of my journey that I didn't grow up in a church that really emphasized the present-day ministry of the Holy Spirit, as we strive to do here at Life Church and many, many other places. So I didn't know a lot about the Holy Spirit until I began attending with Missy back in those days while we were dating a church similar to this. And then I suddenly begin to, to hear more about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And, and so if you're not real familiar with the Holy Spirit, that's okay because not everybody is. That, that doesn't mean anything except for that you have a great opportunity to maybe begin to learn some more. So if I could describe God this way, there is God the Father who's in heaven. There's God the Son, that is Jesus Christ, who came to this earth in earthly form and modeled for us the attributes of God and a life that we should emulate. And then there is the Spirit of God that we refer to as the Holy Spirit, who's active and working in the world today. And so that's the, the as we describe it, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that I really want to focus in on in this particular series. In Acts chapter 19, let me just show you a couple verses and share with you what happened then and what still happens now. The Apostle Paul encounters some people in, in the city. Of, while Paulus, we read, is traveling to Corinth, Paul's going to Ephesus. And he comes in contact with several believers, the Bible says. And in verse 2, he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? The question he's asking is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed on Jesus Christ? And their response was no. We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So these people had placed their faith in Jesus Christ, much like many have today, but they had to admit to Paul, we've not heard anything about the Holy Spirit. Now, admittedly, they're, they're relatively new in their faith, so they've not had a chance to go to church or temple or synagogue, and they've not had a lot of opportunity to, be, uh, to grow in their faith. So here's a wonderful opportunity. If you read on down in that chapter, beginning at verse 3, Paul explains to them about the Holy Spirit. And then he lays hands on them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives them the utterance. And now they're introduced to the present-day ministry of the Holy Spirit. So in a similar way, you can absolutely know about God. You can know about Jesus. You can have placed your faith in Christ. You could be forgiven of your sins. You could have your name written in the book of life in heaven. And you could be on your way to heaven one day when you die and still not know a lot or maybe even much of anything about the Holy Spirit. So that's the purpose of this series. Tell your neighbor, you must have done something right to be able to get to sit close to me today. Huh? <laughs> and so I want to I break this down for you a little bit, show you three things. Well, one thing that the Holy Spirit does and then branch that off into three things. The, the main thought that I want to help us to grasp today is that the Holy Spirit energizes. The Holy Spirit energizes. Now that word energize literally means to make energetic vigorous or active. And so I want to just share with you when there, there are going to be three sub points of this A, B, and C. Each of these are, are constructed in such a way or, and provided to us by the Holy Spirit in such a way that it causes our lives and our faith to be more energetic, 
vigorous or active. Can I just tell you from the outset, the Holy Spirit has never intended for your life with Jesus Christ to be dull, boring, and bland. Now, that doesn't mean that it has to be weird, strange, or unusual, but he wants your life with Christ to be be characterized by those words, energetic, vigorous, active, vibrant, growing, moving, something like that. You could use a lot of different words that's there. And so the Holy Spirit, one of the jobs, if I could say it that way, of the Holy Spirit is to energize our lives, to energize our faith. You know, without Christ, I, I, you know, people have, some people have a, a really good life. They just don't have a, the certainty of, of an afterlife with Christ. But in Christ, you may go through challenges and struggles. In fact, you will. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have those times. But what this means is that through the working of the Holy Spirit, your faith can be active, it can be vigorous, energetic, can be moving, can be growing, despite all of the adversity that you experience in life. In fact, I want to submit to you, some of the people who we would ascribe as being the very closest to God are some of the very same people who've experienced more hell on this earth than you and I have ever known. They've encountered more adversity and opposition. They've even maybe been martyred for their faith, and there's an activeness, there's an energy in their faith that we might want to even emulate somehow or another. We may not want to go through what they've gone through, but we would love to have that kind of faith. Man, when you read about the the New Testament apostles and you discover that all of them were were martyred, they they were killed for their faith. Now, John, the guy who pens for us the book of Revelation, they, they tried to boil him in oil and he survived. And so they, they decided that they would exile him to the island of Patmos. And it's while he's there on the island of Patmos that he receives the revelation, the last book in the Bible, as God reveals himself. But the other guys, Peter's crucified upside down. Others are, are, are murdered and martyred in some horrible ways. And yet we read and we, we, we admire the faith that they have. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about Abraham and Moses and David and others, these great men and women of faith. But then it tucks in there for us the reality that some people died in their faith, never having received the promise, but they saw it at a great distance away from them, and yet they're right there in the hall of fame of faith being acknowledged. You know why? Because there was a, there was a time in their life, there's moments in their life when the Holy Spirit is working and energetic and active, and yes, they may have lost their life, they may have died in their faith, but they had a closeness with Jesus that was, that was admirable and even enviable. I've shared this with you before, but in our church in New Orleans, there was a young man in the congregation that was from China. And one day, he and I were driving through downtown New Orleans, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, I said, Daniel, I said, what was, what's the biggest difference between the church in China and the church in America? And I remember it was raining in New Orleans, and, and he's sitting in the passenger seat of my car, and he's looking out his window, and He didn't respond, and so after a couple of what to me felt like awkward moments, I said again, hey, Daniel, I was wondering, what having grown up in China and now you're in the States, what's the real difference between the church in China and the church in America? It was at that time that Daniel turned and looked at me with tears streaming down his face, and he said, he said, the the difference between the church in China and the church in America is that the church in America doesn't have enough persecution. I stopped my car, opened the door, pushed him out on the side of the road. I'm like, man, I don't know. I don't want that. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, man. He said, our pastors in China, he said, they're arrested, they're beaten, they're in prison. And when they finally do come out, they come out of that prison. They've got a glow about them because they've been with Jesus. They've stood up for their faith. He said, I'm telling you right now, Shell, what the church in America needs is more persecution. I thought, ah, man, I, if there are two lines, one is a line of persecution and a line of, of living at ease, I know which line I'm getting in. With you, I'll be in that line. But Daniel said the church in America needs no more persecution. We need to understand, he was telling me, that our faith means something. Our faith costs us something. And sometimes it's through those times that we discover really the the real value of our faith. So I'm not suggesting to you that you go looking for trouble or persecution or, or that kind of stuff. You don't have to look for it. It will find you. 
It will find you. If you're active in your faith, somebody's going somebody's gonna to oppose you. Somebody's going to make fun of you. Somebody's going to challenge you. Somebody may even persecute you a little bit. But I tell you what, it's sometimes in those moments that the Holy Spirit comes in and energizes and activates us and causes our faith to become more robust than ever before. Our pastor, Roger Brumlow, used to say it this way. He said, Shell, your theology will come back to haunt you. And the first time he said it, I, I said, what, what do you mean, Pastor? He said, well, here's the reality. One day, you're going to come face to face with what you say you believe. You're going to get a chance to live out everything that you say you believe. And I said, okay, like what? He said, well, like, for example, if you believe that God is a healer, one day you're going to be sick. If you believe that God is a provider, one day you're going to be broke. If you believe that God's able to make a way, there's going to come a time in your life you're not going to have any way to be, to, that you can see to get out of that situation. Your theology will come back to haunt you. He said, not in a spooky way, but you're going to get a chance to live out what you believe. Well, I want to lift my hands and tell you right now, I do believe and I know that he is a healer. I do believe and I know that he is a way maker. I do believe and I know that he is a provider. I do know and believe that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond that which we can ask, think, or imagine is my microphone on you'll get a chance to live it out and God wants your faith to be energized and active and vigorous and it's the appointment and the assignment of the Holy Spirit to do that it doesn't require opposition and persecution but sometimes it's through those times that our faith is activated and energized so let me show you what I'm talking about the difficulties that come in life, the circumstances that oppose us oftentimes have a way of draining us of energy and passion and zeal for God, don't they? Thank you, Missy. So let me say it again. The difficulties, the circumstances, and sometimes even people in life have a way of draining us of our energy and our passion, don't they? Sometimes can't you just, just, just go one day without having somebody else to get on your reserve nerve? Couldn't you just love to get a break and just somebody just back away and leave you alone for a while? Well, I could recommend the treehouse in uh, Tennessee. You don't even have a cell phone signal there. And the Wi-Fi ain't no good either, y'all. I'll just tell you. I'm going to tell you the rest of that story. See, but the good news is that the Holy Spirit is able to energize you. Letter A, he'll energize your life with purpose. With purpose. Now, that's a kind of a vague and ethereal word in some ways, but the truth is, is that there is a purpose for our lives that some of us have maybe yet to discover in its fullness. And I'm not even sure that on any particular day, we will be able to grasp the totality of our purpose here in life and say, okay, now I get it. Because here's what I'm continuing to learn as I'm in this journey of life and the journey of faith is that just about the time that I think I have a pretty good understanding of my purpose, all of a sudden circumstances shift and, 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 and my, maybe the group that I'm with in that moment has changed from where I was or the people that I'm talking to. And, and, and all of a sudden I begin to see my purpose morph in a little different way. A lot of you know this, but I wear a lot of different hats. I am, I am a a follower of Jesus Christ first and foremost, and then I am Missy's husband, and I'm S.J. and Summer's dad, and I'm Tina's father-in-law, and I'm Cooper and Maddox's grandfather, and notice I'm coming down through the most important relationships, and then, and then I'm your pastor, and I'm the chaplain for the fire department, the head chaplain for the police department, and I'm the vice president of the board of trustees for Beulah Heights University, I'm, and I'm the Metro Atlanta Regional Presbyter for the Assemblies of God. And I'm on this board and this committee and this foundation. And I'm not, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I wear a lot of different hats. And depending on the audience with whom I'm with in that moment determines to a large degree my purpose in that moment. Does that make sense? Because I can't be the, the chaplain of the fire department when... Missy and I are, are at dinner together, or we're having a romantic moment. She doesn't need the chaplain of the fire department. Come on, somebody. Act like you're saved with me. She needs her husband. And then I can't be Missy's husband when I'm, at, you know, dealing with the police officers in the police department. They don't need me to be Missy's husband. They need me to be their head chaplain. And then in all of these roles in my life, the audience is different 
And so in those moments, my purpose has to be different. Summer, if you don't mind me dragging you into this message, I appreciate it. There have been times in both Summer and SJ that as they were coming up and parenting them, they might say something to me like, I just need you to be my dad. I don't, I don't need you to be my pastor right now. And they were telling me, take your pastor hat off and just put on your dad hat because that's your real purpose right now. And so somewhere in the conversation, I would say, well, you know what the Bible says? I don't, no, no, don't put that pastor hat back on. Just, just be my daddy. Just be my daddy right now. Be my dad. But see, because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ first and foremost, the Word of God moves in and out of all of those roles and all of those things. And so in a sense, my primary purpose in life is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And that should affect the way that I'm a husband. And that should affect the way that I'm a father and that I'm a grandfather and then that I'm a pastor and all of these other things, my primary purpose in life should be that I find myself complete in him and I allow him to be my sole purpose and, and follow him in all that I do, then everything else has a way of being positively affected by that. And it's the same for you. You may have different roles and different assignments and all of those things, but your primary purpose will be found in your relationship with Christ. Jeremiah 29, 11, this is God speaking. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. Now, that lets me know that we may not know the plans that he has for us, but he has no question at all about the plans that he has for us. He says, these plans are for your good and not for your disaster. Somebody ought to shout right there to give you a future and a hope. Now, I got to tell you, that's the purpose that God has for you. The purpose that you have for you, the plan that you have for you, may not be like this. Some of us have lived long enough to go through some iterations in life to where for a while we thought, well, I want to go down this particular career path. And so if you were still in school or you need to go to school, you, you chose a, a, your classes and your major based on that particular career path. And then suddenly, God comes along and begins to adjust and modify and guide you in a different way. And so suddenly now, you got to skip over and take some different classes and have a different major, don't you, Summer? And all of a sudden, did I say your name out loud? And then all of a sudden, but listen, here's the truth. You're, Summer, let me say to you, because I, I brought you in humorously, that, that plan, that, that path or that, part, that course that you're on for academics may need to change a few more times, but the purpose that God has for you was restored on Sunday, August the 27th, 2017, when you came to this altar and you gave your life back to Christ, and you will find in him, Summer, everything that you need. When she was four and a half, she told me, I want to, Jesus just told me he wants me to be a missionary to the children of India. She hasn't gone to India yet, but she still may be a missionary to the children of India one day. And I looked at her through tears, and I said, I'm going to miss you, baby. You may still do that. Later on, she said to her mom, do you think Jesus will let me be a missionary to the children of India and a motorcycle cop? <laughs> her mom said, absolutely, baby. He could, he could do that. And then just while I'm dragging you into this thing, then there have been times where you thought, well, I believe it's this, and I sense it, it's this. And then later on, God reveals something. And then suddenly your career path is taking a little change, and your educational path is taking a little bit of change. And that's okay, sweetheart. This is between me and my daughter right now. Y'all just eavesdrop. That's okay. It's all right. It's okay. God will continue to refine that. Sometimes we think we know, and all of a sudden, then we begin to discover that God says, wait a minute, I've got plans to give you a future, and that future is for your good. It's not for your evil. It's a future filled with hope and a future filled with blessings and favor. And we don't always know everything on day one, do we? Sometimes we change careers a few times even after accepting a job that brings us to a place and that changes and then all of a sudden we're in a new place and then it may change again and we're in a new place. Isn't that right, David Chase? But all the while, your purpose is still the same because he says, I know the plans that I have for you, David. It's plans to give you a future and a hope. Where's Dale Abery? Dale, it changed a little bit when Katrina hit New Orleans and blew you guys all the way up here to Atlanta, didn't it? Been through different things and different circumstances, but the purpose of God has never changed. It's still the same to give you a future and to give you a hope. That the Holy Spirit energizes you with purpose. If you're here today and you say, I have no idea what my purpose is, you're in the right place at the right time because the Holy Spirit wants to help you with that. 
In Romans chapter 12, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Would you say reasonable service? This isn't fanaticism. This isn't, oh, you're a Jesus freak. Oh, this isn't, oh, you just become so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. No, Paul says, give everything you have to God. That's just your reasonable service. And then he goes on to say, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that, shout so that, everything in those verses leads you to this, so that you may prove or understand or comprehend or experience what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Church, I want you to realize that it is in the laying down of your life to your plans, your dreams, your vision, your goal, your aspiration, your hopes, your dreams. It is in the laying down of all of that and surrendering to the Lordship of Christ, giving everything to Him, it is there that you will find your purpose. And it will be through that act of surrender and commitment and dedication, which, by the way, is not just a single act in your life. It will be a regular act that you'll need to revisit over and over and over. Because if there's anything about a sacrifice that we understand, from the Old Testament, the animal had to be tied to the altar so that it could then be slain on the altar being sacrificed to God. I'm going to tell you what, there are going to be times that God's going to have you tied up to the altar so you can't pull away because there's going to be a time and a place and a moment where that sacrifice needs to be offered over and over. Thank God, he says, you're a living sacrifice. Not a dying sacrifice, because God hadn't called you to die for him. He's calling you to live for him. And that's your purpose, is to live for him. But it's a surrender of self and all that I want and all my dreams and aspirations. In fact, I want to tell you, I want to be what I was when I wanted to be what I am. Those were much simpler times back then. All of us grow up with dreams and ideas and visions of what we want. And as we get older, they change, and we realize Okay, I'm, I'm four foot eleven. I'm probably not going to be an NBA starting center for the Atlanta Hawks. It's just it ain't going to happen. Or you dream about being this amazing singer, and then you finally listen to what everybody's telling you, saying, "Sweetheart, you can't. You, you're terrible at singing. You just, you can't. You might can hum or play an instrument, but baby, you just can't." Sing. Sometimes those dreams change and plans. But as you surrender everything to God, as you lay everything down, saying, God, not my will, but your will. Does anybody ever remember anybody in the Bible saying something like that? Who said that? Jesus. He said, Father, not my will, but, come on, Bible readers, your will be done. A living sacrifice. He said, it's in those moments that you'll be able to prove understand, discern, embrace, however you want to translate that, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I want to help you with something. You can disagree with me, and I'll respect you, but you'll still be wrong. (laughs) I said that almost jokingly, almost. Some people say, oh, well, this verse means that God has three wills for your life. He has a good will, an acceptable will, and then he has a perfect will. And the good will is like, okay, uh, you know, you're going to get married and you're a guy, and so the good will of God is that you marry any woman out there. And God would be okay with that. It's, that's good. And, and in their thinking, then the acceptable will of God is that, okay, the 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 crowd gets smaller from the billions of women that you could possibly marry that are of the right age and all that kind of stuff, too. Okay, well, now it's somebody that's more compatible to you, that shares your faith or whatever. Okay, well, that's, that's acceptable. Oh, but then there's that perfect will of God, that there's that one woman in all the world, sir, for you that God wants you to marry. And if you marry any woman out there who's old enough to be married, then that's, that's, that's good. But if you marry somebody who's like more closely compatible to you, then okay, that's my acceptable will for you. But if you marry the one that I have for you, then now you're in my perfect will. 
And I don't believe that's what Scripture supports. I believe God has a will for your life. Notice the verbiage. When you've done all this, you'll be able to prove what is that. Not those, not these, not all them, but what is that good and acceptable and perfect will, singular, not wills, of God. You see, here's what I want you to consider. Maybe you believe differently. That's, that's okay. I, I think God can help us with this. But God's will for your life is good. It's good. It's going to be acceptable to you because like Jesus in the garden, you're going to be able to say, all right, not my will, but thy will be done. And okay, God, we'll, we'll do this thing. And God's will for your life is perfect for you. His will for your life may not be perfect for somebody else, and his will for their life may not be perfect for you, but his will in your life, oh, it's a good thing in your life. It's going to be acceptable. You're going to be able to go, yeah, God, that's it. I know. I understand it. I receive that. I accept that. And God's going to be going, yeah, you're right there in the perfect center of my will, not good, acceptable, and perfect somewhere, because James tells us that if you're double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways, so if God is triple-minded, he can't be trusted at all. He has a good will for your life that's acceptable for you, and that it's the perfect will of God for your life. And God wants you to discover that as you lay down everything, and you surrender to him, and you say, God, not my will. Not my educational path, not my career path, not my relationship path, not my whatever path. God, I want to be right where you want me to be. And see, the Holy Spirit will guide you and direct you on that. And when you're walking along and you're getting off track so what, a little bit, the Holy Spirit has a way of bringing you back, don't he, somebody? Don't he, somebody? He'll nudge you back. You'll get over here on the, on the, in the weeds of life, and suddenly you're not happy. You're not content. You're not satisfied. There's no peace in your life. And the Holy Spirit's saying, let me bring you back to your purpose. Let me bring you back over here. Psalm 137 says, the steps of righteous people are ordered by the Lord, and God takes delight in their way. Psalm 37, 16, but verse 17 says, though you may stumble and fall, you're going to wind up in the weeds every once in a while. You're going to stub your toe occasionally. You're going to miss your exit. Have I got enough allegories in there? Are you picking up on this? You're going to miss it at some point. You're not going to live constantly in the middle of God's will. You're going to make some stupid mistakes. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. But the Holy Spirit energizes you with purpose, brings you back to a place to where suddenly you remember I remember, and I'll just use some examples. I remember being at youth camp and hearing the Holy Spirit say, I want to use you for my glory. I can remember being in that service and sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit saying, I've got a plan for your life. I've got a purpose for your life. I can remember reading in the Bible, it talks about all the goodness of God that he wants to give me. It's his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. And God suddenly began to remind you through the Holy Spirit, okay, you've wandered, you've strayed, you've gotten off path, but I'm bringing you back to the center of your purpose. And you might be here today and you can say, yeah, I think I was there 40 years ago, but it's been so long. I'm not in the weeds. I'm on the other side of the world. Then the Holy Spirit is telling you right now, I'm bringing you back to your purpose. I'm bringing you back to the center. I'm bringing you back to why I created you. You've not gone too far. You've not done too much. You've not failed too many times. My goodness, my acceptable, perfect will is still here for your life. And you can still yet fulfill it. You can be like Caleb saying, I'm 85 years old, and God made me a promise 40 years ago. Give me my mountain. I still want everything that God promised me. You can be like Abraham and Sarah. God promised you a child in your old age. You take matters into your own hands. Hagar enters in the picture. Abraham sleeps with his wife, handmaid. He's a stupid man, but he did it anyway. And Ishmael's born, and it creates havoc and hell on this earth. But God still brought Isaac to them at that appointed time. Why? Because God said, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for your good, to give you future and a hope. He said, man, you could be like David, a man after God's own heart, and find yourself on the top of your roof lusting at another man's wife, Bathsheba, bringing her into your palace and sleeping with her, her getting pregnant, sending her home, having her husband murdered. You're like, you, I can do all that? No. No, you're not supposed to do all that. 
But the Holy Spirit still brings David back to a place where he comes to face to face. I'm just talking about you having a purpose in life. And no matter how many times you failed, God has never removed his purpose from your life and from your destiny. The calling and the plans and the will of God are irrevocable. It doesn't matter how many times you failed and floundered and struggled in your life. The purposes of God are still there for you. I just wonder, is anybody ready to step into your purpose like never before? I believe that can happen today, and the Holy Spirit wants to energize you, reminding of your purpose, laying down everything, surrendering everything, saying yes to him. It's where you'll discover your purpose. Point number two is he energizes you with love. It's letter B. Letter C is he energizes you with power. Now I'm through. I just filled in your blanks for you. I might deal with B and C later on. Pastor Christian and the team, would you come back? I feel a stirring in my heart and in my spirit, if I could say it that way, that I didn't anticipate. Surely it must be that the Holy Spirit is wanting to do something that he didn't tell me he was going to do. Is that all right with you? I say, is that all right with you? Because... He knew everybody who was going to be here. And there's something about this part of the message that God wants us to pause and I believe just kind of conclude with. So I'll let you fill in your blanks. He energizes you with love, energizes you with power. But how about this purpose thing? How about this... Are you the one, sir? Ma'am, could you be the one that God would just say, listen, Shell, you can deal with the rest of that later, but right now, sir, ma'am, he knows your heart is so inclined to him that you're about to step into your destiny like you thought maybe had been abandoned. You may have thought you've done too much wrong, gone too far, turned your back too many times, and the Holy Spirit is energizing you, pulling you back from being way over here to being right here in the middle of God's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The things that God has for us are nothing short of miraculous. And God is a motion-activated God. I said it earlier. Sometimes what he's waiting on. While we think we're waiting on him, he's really just waiting on us. And he's saying, I need you to take this step. I need you to surrender once again. I need you to come back to your purpose. Yes, some years have passed. Yes, some heartache has come along. But God's wanting you to know, sir, ma'am, that his purpose is still established. And he wants you to walk in that like never before. Would you bow your heads with me? Thanks for joining us today. We hope this message ministered to you. We'd love to connect with you online, our website, www.lifechurchsmyrna.com. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you.